Good evening, Evangel, and welcome to another time of Bible study with Eyes of Faith as we look tonight at the life of David. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to gather around your word. And I pray that you would open it to us tonight. I pray that you give us ears to hear what it is that you would be speaking to us from this precious word. Lord, open our eyes so that we would see Jesus high and lifted up for your glory and for your namesake. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to excuse me, Hebrews chapter 11, looking again at verse 32. What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens. We can't overstress it enough, looking at the idea that Jesus is the one who gives us our faith, he's the author of it, and he's the perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Over and over again, as we have been looking at these individuals and these groups of people in Hebrews chapter 11, we're seeing the same thing, that Jesus is the foundation of our faith. Come back to chapter 11 and the first verse once again. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So when it says that it's the substance of things hoped for, that's what faith is, it speaks about that which underlies the apparent, the things that are around us, the thing that, things that are seen. That we need to be aware of those things that underlie the apparent rather than keeping our focus on the apparent themselves. That which underlies the apparent is always and ever Jesus. He is the foundation. He's the ground of our confidence. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, come there with me for a moment, please. 2 Corinthians and chapter 4. All right, so when we look at this passage, look at verse 16. Therefore we don't lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We've looked at this earlier on in our studies in chapter 11 of Hebrews. But it's worth being reminded of once again. And down in chapter 5 and verse 7 of 2 Corinthians, it says, So we walk by faith and not by sight. Jesus is the, the one who is the foundation of our faith, the one that is be, underneath it all who underlies the apparent. So let's set our eyes on Jesus once again as we have a look at um, these individuals and specifically David tonight as we look at his account. Out of weakness were made strong. So come back with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. When you think about David, this is probably the most pre prevailing story or account that we would have come up. David and Goliath. Chapter 17, 1 Samuel, the first two verses to begin with. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and they encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes-Damon, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together. 
they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. All right, so we want to look tonight at the, the lay of the land, the geography, so that we can appreciate what's going on in this context so we can visualize it a bit more effectively and accurately. If you recall, when we looked at the account of Samson, we dealt with the Shephelah, the area between uh, the mountain region of Israel down to the coastal plain of the area where the Philistines lived. Between those two areas is the Shephelah, the foothills, the lowlands. So that's going to be the focus of our attention in this context. I apologize about my mouse not moving correctly in order to make that transition. All right, the Shvela is that area that is outlined in red for you. Pay attention to just right, just west, uh, excuse me, not west, just east of the Shvela. Uh, you will see the top of the Dead Sea and and if you come between the Shvela and the Dead Sea at the top part, you will see Jerusalem. And just below Jerusalem, you will see Bethlehem. Those areas are going to come into uh, interest for us in this study. Now in the Shvela, you will notice that there are some valleys, the green areas that run horizontally across the Shvela. You've got the Aijalon Valley. And then you've got the Sorek Valley. The Sorek is the one that we were interested in when we spent time looking at Samson. The one that's below that is the Ela Valley. As we look at the Ela Valley, we, we need to be aware of Saul's camp, which is in the blue box. The arrow that's pointed out there is the Ela Valley. Look at the arrow that begins in the middle of your screen, just above Judah, all in blue cap letters in Bethlehem. So David lived in Bethlehem. That's where he's coming from when he arrives at the Valley of Ela. So Saul's camp is in the Ela Valley. Here's uh, another indication of that Elah Valley. The Elah is uh, just about the middle of your screen. I'll give you a second to have a look at that. About the middle of your screen. The coastal plain is where the Philistines live. We're going to take a little closer view of that now. So again, in the middle of your screen is the Elah Valley. Looking from east to west. So east is on the Judah side going to the west, which is heading toward the coast, you'll notice Gath. That's one of the five main cities of the Philistines. Gath comes into great interest for us in this account. But the battle is taking place in the Elah Valley. So again, coming closer. So Sukho is right underneath where you see the word Elah, Elah Valley. And across from that is where the Philistines would have been encamped. So Saul and his men, were, they were gathered, uh, ready for battle. One on the Philistines on one side, the camp of Israel on the other. Now this is looking at that valley once again. So the Elah Valley is, is the area that's not as dark green. And this is looking from the north now, looking from the top of the map, looking southward. So it's turned around for you. On your, the right-hand side would be heading to the Mediterranean Sea. On the left-hand side or to the east is heading towards Jerusalem and the Dead Sea. So you'll notice where the Philistine camp is located. And you've got the Israelite camp on the opposite side, or the north side, the side that's uh, on the lower portion of your screen. Azekah is to the, almost the farthest right. 
That was one of the towns. And then you have Gath, which is just a little bit further uh, west than that yet again. So that valley is the region where this battle is taking place. So we'll bring that map up for you again so that you can have a little better view of it. Uh, but for your reference, these maps and images for each study is uploaded to our website, evangelheartland.com, under audio messages. So whatever you see as far as images and maps are concerned, you can find them there in a PowerPoint format and PDF. So you can take advantage of that as you would like to. All right, so thinking about this uh, idea is that all too often people come to the scriptures with this idea that the scriptures are about me. Not so much that they contain stories about me, obviously, but that they come to the scriptures to see what the scriptures have to say about them, uh, what to do, how to live, the principles that are involved. Although the scriptures do give that kind of information, first and foremost, the scriptures are all about Jesus, no matter where you turn, particularly in the New Testament, of course, where we have the direct explicit stories of Christ. You see in the Old Testament, right from the very beginning, Jesus is embedded before anyone or anything else is, appears there. It's Jesus. It's all about him. So I want to look here at David. In chapter 16, we find out that David has been anointed as the king of Israel. But Saul is still the one sitting, sitting on the throne. He's still the one who's reigning. And David won't be the king for another 15, 17 years. See, David is in a position at this point in time of serving. And even in that, we see a picture of Christ. So in two aspects, Jesus came, although he was the king, he is the king, he didn't come to rule and reign as the king on his first um, coming to the earth. Look back in Mark chapter 10. I want to have a look at a passage here in Mark chapter 10, verse 42. Jesus called his disciples to himself, and he said, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whosoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So here we see Jesus at his first coming. He, he was fully king, but he didn't come to rule and reign. That won't be until his second coming when he returns to literally rule sitting on the throne of his father David, even as Gabriel had told Mary when she, the announcement came to her that she was going to conceive and bear a, a son. So David, he's been anointed as king and here he is serving Saul. We see him in the latter half of chapter 16. Once Samuel anoints him as king, he is serving Saul. Then we see down in uh, verse 17 of chapter 16, or excuse me, chapter 17 of Samuel. So 17, 17. David's father, Jesse, said to his son, David, take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers are doing and bring back news of them. Verse 20. So David got up early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper and took the things and went as David, or excuse me, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. So here David, he's coming to serve his brothers, to serve his father, to serve the captain of the thousands. Picturing, foreshadowing for us, Jesus 
over and over again, we can't help but seeing Jesus pictured in the scriptures. Now let's go back to verse 4. With the Philistines standing on one side of the mountain, I'll bring that up for you again to have a look at. So we've got the Philistines on one side, the south side of, of the valley, and then the Israelites on the north side. And remember, as you're looking at this map, south is, uh, you're looking down towards the south. You're looking from the north with the red, uh, the, the, with the Mediterranean Sea on your right or the west, the Dead Sea to your left or on the east. Jerusalem is that way to the east as well, to your left. All right, so we, we have them lined up and in that Elah Valley, we see uh, the Philistines, they have a champion. Verse four, he went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath and he was from Gath. Have a look at your map and you'll see Gath is on the westernmost part of that particular map on your left. So he's from Gath, one of the cities, one of the five chief cities of the Philistines. And here they are in the Valley of Elah, across from each other. Elah, of course, meaning um, oak or strength. And God is bringing them to this position, this place, so that uh, his strength will be demonstrated on behalf of his people. Look what it says about Goliath, about this giant. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. So in verse 4, we see the size of this man is, is significant that he stands over nine feet tall, uh, where it's six cubits and a span. Uh, depending upon the, the length of that cubit that's being used, he could be anywhere from nine and a half to almost 11 feet tall. But let's, let's go with the conservative side just to get an idea that even at the shortest possible height that this man could be, he was still a giant of a man. Uh, this will give you an idea. All right, so we've got um, um, an average size man that's standing at about five foot ten, I suppose that is. So not quite, uh, not quite six foot high. We've got the height of a ten-year-old and a and a seven-year-old average. So that's what they would be at this um, at this point in time or in in today's age. And then we see the height of Goliath, the shadow outlined in blue, almost ten feet tall. So nine and a half to 10 feet tall. So you can see that even at the sh shortest height that Goliath might have been, he's still a massive, massive man. Not somebody that you and I would want to come up against. But God is giving us this picture here to show us that in, even though giants, even though our enemies may be formidable, and very large, they don't, they, they, they have nothing against the strength of our God, Elah. The, this valley, the strength of God is about to be demonstrated. God is, is going to show his strength on behalf of his people. Well, I want to look back at Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 7. So under Moses, God had given them some promises. And this is one of them. So Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 7. This is what Moses is telling them and reminding the people of God, of which David is one, Saul, and the other men that are, are there lined up, camped in battle. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way, and flee before you seven ways. This is the promise of God. Then I want to go ahead to Joshua chapter 23. So the very next book, Joshua chapter 23. I want to look at verse 10. This is coming on the end of, of Joshua's life. 
Here's what he says to them. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you. But it doesn't stop there. For the Lord your God is he who fights for you as he promised. That it's not a maybe God will fight for us, but he promised that he would fight for us. And he has, he is fighting for them, and he will fight for them. And that's what we see even in our lives. That's what we, one aspect here, we see that Jesus is being uh, pictured here by David. That it's not David going up in his strength. This story is not about David and how he overcame the giant. This is about Jesus. David represents Christ here. That Jesus is the one who destroys the enemies, the giants in our lives even as God has promised. Now, in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8, it says that the, the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Um, when it speaks about him being our rear guard, it, it's this idea, I want to write it on the board for you here. It's the word asaph. So the, this is it in Hebrew, the Aleph, the Samek, and the Pe. Then we've got, uh, this, is, this is literally what it means, or what the word is, a sof, if you were to translate it, if you were to write it in English. But uh, I want to see what this word literally means. In, in Hebrew, the letters represent uh, symbols or types and we've got, with the Aleph, you've got a strong leader. Then with the Samek, we have support. It literally means support. And uh, with the Pe, it means um, out of the mouth, so to speak. So we'll put speak here. It also means to declare. So can we put those together? Let's, I want to make sure that you can, you can see that, that it's not off of your screen. All right. So when we put those together, it says that the strong leader has declared that he will support that he supports, or he is declaring. The strong leader is declaring support for his people. That the glory of the Lord will be your rear, behind you, your rear guard. That he, the strong leader comes, he declares his support of us. That he will give us victory. That he will fight for us, even as he has promised. Now, let's go back to Exodus chapter 14 to get the picture of this. Exodus chapter 14, coming from the Red Sea. The waters are being parted. Looking at verse 19, the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and became their Asaph. The strong leader declared was declaring support. He went behind them. So not only the angel of the Lord, which we know is Jesus, but the pillar of cloud the, representing the glory of God came with him. So that the glory of God, remember the glory of the Lord, so the Lord and his glory, the angel of the Lord and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. Do you see the picture here? So this is what we are getting with this battle that's, that's taking place in the Valley of Elah. Now, let's continue on here. I want to look at one more verse in verse 25, uh, still in Exodus chapter 14. And he took off their chariot wheels, that's the angel of the Lord, God Almighty. He took off the chariot wheels of the Egyptians so that they drove them with great difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let's flee from the face of Israel. 
for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So this is how God led them out. This is how God continued to lead them. This was their heritage, their history. The promise of God was going before them. And David knew the promises of God. And so this is what he is standing on. So coming back to chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, David knows that the glory of the Lord asafts them, surrounds them. So uh, coming back to chapter 17, let's look at verse, uh, let's look at verses 20 to 24. So David, he got up early in the morning. We've looked at this part already. He went, com uh, took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him because they were dreadfully afraid. They ran from him because they were terrified. We see the same thing back in verse 11. With Goliath coming out day after day for 40 days, morning and evening, it's like he's taunting the very promises of God. What is, what is the picture that we should have when we hear morning and evening? When he came out every day for 40 days, morning and evening. Morning and evening should bring this to mind. That with the people of Israel, the priest, he would bring a sacrifice before the Lord in the morning and in the evening. In the morning and the evening. And the picture that we have there is also of Jesus, because Jesus was taken and crucified in the morning, and he gave up the ghost in the evening, at the time of the evening sacrifice. The evening is literally coming on to late afternoon. That's the, the way that the Hebrew uh, has that context. So the morning and the evening, we see a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus, him conquering every enemy of our souls. So the enemy coming uh, every morning and every evening to taunt them for 40 days. Keep in mind that Jesus is the one who, through 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, withstood every temptation that came against him. That's why the scripture says that he was tempted in every way like us, yet without sin. Therefore, he knows fully what we are tempted with. He's not unacquainted. He's been tempted in every way. He's gone ahead of us into the heavens. And so because he's gone before us, he's been tempted every way, yet without sin, that we are able to come to the throne of grace with confidence to obtain mercy and to find grace to help us in our time of need. So here's David, uh, verse 26 now. Uh, David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab, his anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why do you come down here? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Well, David hasn't come there just as a curiosity seeker. He's come with the faith of God Almighty. He knows that this is one who is coming against the glory of God. He has heard the taunts of the enemy, and he says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And why are we quaking and shaking with fear? They were dismayed and greatly 
afraid. So David stands up. He asks the question, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine? He's not just looking for the reward, but I can't help but seeing here a hint of Jesus who is saying, what will be done for the one who kills the enemy of my people? And God the Father says that I'm going to give them into your hands. I will bless you with them. I'm going to give them to you as your inheritance. Well, uh, Eliab, he's... His older brother, oldest brother, he's coming against him. And we're going to find that those who are struck with fear and inaction are going to rebuke those who are walking in faith and victory. David, he's not afraid. He's not shrinking back with fear or terror. He's rising up with faith. Now, remember, by faith, they subdued nations. By faith, they turned away the sword. And by faith, their strength was turned, or the, excuse me, their weakness was turned to strength, and they routed the aliens. And that's what we're going to see takes place with the Philistines. They're going to end up being routed. See, Goliath said, um, I'm coming against you. You send one of your, cha- your champion to fight against me. Well, looking at the people of Israel, Saul, we're told, we are told, was head and shoulders taller than everybody else in the nation. So if anybody who appeared to be the best candidate to go up against this giant would be the tallest of the men who had just happened to be the king. But he was the king who was selected by the people. He was the king who was the response to the cry of the people. We don't want you as our king anymore, God. We want to be like the nations around us. But Saul is terrified. He won't go against this champion because he doesn't have faith in God. And here comes David, the least likely of anyone because he's the youngest. He's not even a soldier. But again, representing Christ as a type and a shadow of Jesus. He comes saying that it it will be in the name of the Lord of hosts, the Lord Sabaoth. We're going to look at that in just a second. But this idea of those who are struck with fear and inaction, here's what happens to them. Go back to Deuteronomy, and I want to look at chapter 32. Now, do you remember the promise or, that was given in Deuteronomy chapter 28? We, we read that shortly ago. Do you remember what it said? I'm going to read it to you again. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They will come out against you one way, and they'll flee from you seven ways. Joshua said in chapter 23, verse 10, that your enemy, you will, one will rout a thousand. Now, look at chapter 32 of Deuteronomy. And I want to look at verses 30 and 31. How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them? For their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Well, what does that mean? How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight? Oftentimes we, we hear this misquoted and saying that, for us, as in Christ, one will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to, to flight, causing them to run away. But that's not the case. He's not talking about those who are the Lord's and put their faith in Him. He's talking about the enemies of God will put us to flight. But how could they put a thousand, one put a thousand of us to flight, and two of them put ten thousand of us to flight, unless our rock had sold us? What does that mean? Well, look at back in verse 28. There's warnings over and over again. Look at verse 19. When the Lord saw it, he spurred them, spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. He said, I'll hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be because they're a perverse generation. And, and it's continuing on about this, how they, the people of God had sacrificed to 
idols and they had gone after other things instead of God. And God said, I'll, I'll let them be, I'll let them to their own resources, to the consequences of their own choices, and we'll see what happens. Well, he knows what will happen, but allow them to see. He says in verse 23, I'll heap disasters on them. I will spend my arrows on them. Those, that's speaking of his own people who turn away from him. It's not in vengeance, but to show that, that the, the hand of the Lord is against those who are walking in pride. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He lifts up the humble. So we need the grace of God. So that's when it says, verse 28, For they are a nation, they are void of counsel, nor is there any understanding on, on, in them. Speaking of his own people who have turned away from him. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. So how could any of their enemies, how could even one of their enemies put a thousand of them to flight and two of their enemies put ten thousand of them to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had surrendered them. Because their rock, the rock of their enemies, whatever they put their strength in, is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. What's the picture here? Unless the Lord sold them. You know that there's at least five times that the Lord says, the scripture says, in, in judges particularly, um, is where the bulk of them are found. And then once in 1 Samuel chapter 12, over and over again, it says, and the Lord sold them into the hands of the Amalekites, into the hands of the Philistines, and so on and so on, twice into the hands of the Philistines. I'll give you the, uh, the places where they're found. So in Judges, I'll erase this. In the book of Judges, we see it in chapter 2 and verse 14, chapter 3 and verse 8, 4 and verse 2, 10 and verse 7. And then we see it in first, I don't want to go off of your screen there, we'll also see it in first Samuel. And that's in chapter 12. And verse, I said uh, seven earlier, I think, but it's in verse nine, 12 and verse nine. Each time saying the Lord sold them into the hands of these various enemies. See, that's what the book of Judges was about, showing that they turned away from their fountain, turned away from their rock. And God sold them into the hands of their enemies. And as a result, one of their enemies put a thousand of them to flight. Two of their enemies put 10,000 of them to flight. That's simply speaking about the dominance of their enemies over the people of God when they had rejected their own rock, their own strength. Well, this is what we see here with the people of Israel in chapter 17. They had rejected the Lord in a sense because they're not going in the strength that God had provided for them. Even as Elah speaks of strength, oak, uh, oak being such a strong uh, represent, a representation of strength of a strong tree. God has gone before them. He's their rear guard and all they can see is their own strength. All they see is their champion. And they don't have anything in their own strength that can match their champion pound per, for pound, um, strength for strength. Except that their God, their strength, their champion was one that they weren't even recognizing. God himself. See, it wasn't a, they looked at it and said, it's not a fair fight. Look at how big this guy is. Look at their giant. Look at their champion. It's, it's not fair. If we send one of ours against him, we are doomed. Even if we send our biggest, toughest guy, we're still doomed. If we send Saul, Saul can't even do it. See, they were looking at the strength of man, and man has no strength at all in and of himself against our enemies. David saw something bigger, saw someone greater. 
and that was God himself, that God is their champion. God is our champion. David wasn't going in his own strength. He was going in the strength of God, even though he was young, inexperienced in battle, in war. Even as Saul said, he says that this man, he said, you're just a youth, and this man has been fighting since he was your age. You're not experienced. Well, I want to go ahead here and look at verse 32. David said to Saul, don't let anyone's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth and he's a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he, he, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. See, when we see David going up against this giant, that he's not looking at the size of this man, he's looking at the size of his God. He had eyes of faith. So he goes up against him. Uh, this is, it's a singular champion. One man goes out against him, but he seems that he's not qualified to do so. When you looked at Jesus, in, when he was here on earth, there was nothing about him, Isaiah 53 says, that dr would draw somebody to him as far as his physical appearance was concerned. He wasn't more handsome. He didn't have rugged good looks uh, that were more attractive than everybody else's. He was just an average looking man. He came not to stand out in his appearance, but to stand out in his character. So one singular champion goes out, and this is how David is representing Jesus, that Jesus goes out. He goes in the strength of God. God will deliver him into my hand. And that's why we see that in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That's why we're able to stand against the evil one. Having done all to stand firm and putting on the whole armor of God. That's what this picture is. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the strength that he gives to us. Well, let's look down in verse 38. Saul clothed David with his armor, put a bronze helmet on his head. And he also clothed him with a coat of mail. So it's armor. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, but he'd not tested them. He said, I can't walk in these. I've not tested them. So David took them off. And he took what was, what he, what was tested and tried. He took his staff and he took his sling and he went down into the brook between those two camps at the, at the base of those two mountains. In the valley of Elah was a brook, the brook of Elah, and there he went and got the, um, the five stones. So here we have the Elah Valley, and running down the middle of that valley is the brook that, that David went down and withdrew five stones, five smooth stones. And as he goes, he came near to the Philistine. You notice those who are filled with faith, faith in God, that they don't run away from their enemy, but they stand strong even to the point where David comes near and he ends up running towards his enemy. Now remember, this is a picture of Jesus. We don't just foolhardily um, run against our enemy, even to the point that um, we're told in the New Testament that 
we need to be careful how we come against our enemy. Even Michael the archangel didn't come presumptuously, but rather he said, the Lord rebuke you. In the book of Jude, we read that. The Lord rebuke you to, the, to Satan. So it wasn't about his strength, but it was the strength that God Almighty gives. So he goes, not presumptuously, but knowing, bolstered by faith in God and the promises that God has made. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him because he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. The Philistine said, am I a dog that you come with me to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come to me and I will feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said, verse 45, you come to me with a sword, a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you. In the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. The Lord of hosts, the Lord Sabaoth. It's what we see in Joshua chapter 5, when Jesus appears before Joshua, before they go to battle at Jericho. The Lord, the captain of the army of the Lord of hosts. That's who this is in um, in Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Sabaoth, is the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty. So in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, I come against you. The Lord is going to hand your life into mine, and I'm going to take your head off of you. Church, here's another picture of Jesus. I'm going to take your head off of you, and I'm going to feed your carcass, the carcass, carcasses of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Well, they went to battle. The Philistine arose, came and drew near. David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, takes out a, a stone, puts it in his pouch, in the pouch of his sling, and he slings the stone and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. But that's not what killed him. Here's what killed him. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Remember? They'll come to you one way and they'll flee from you seven. This is what the Lord your God has promised. So all of Israel, they were bolstered in their faith because their champion had gone before them. Not David, but God. God had given them the victory and so their faith is strengthened and rises up and then they go to battle to pursue the enemies, their enemy that is running away from them as they run down the Elah Valley towards the coastal plain, towards Gath, and uh, as they're running, the, they're scattering every which way, trying to find refuge and hiding, but God is giving them victory. They're going as far as Gath and Ekron, even so into the territories of the Philistines, and they're taking that territory back. I want you to pay special attention to verse 54. Interesting the way it's spoken about here. David took the head of the Philistine, so read there Goliath. So let's read that. David took the head of Goliath, their champion, and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put his armor in his tent. Put the armor of Goliath in his tent. That's interesting. Why did he take the head of Goliath to Jerusalem? Think about it for a moment. Jerusalem isn't even in Israelite control at this point in time. Saul's capital is uh, just north of Jerusalem in Gibeon, Gibeah. 
David, when he becomes king, his capital will be in um, Hebron. So I want to show you this so you can have a, a look. So you'll notice um, Jerusalem is in the blue box. Then you have um, Gibeah. I had mentioned I said Gibeah, and so, but it's uh, Gibeah where Saul's capital had been, just north, just above Jerusalem. But where you see Judah in the bold capital letters, just below that is Hebron. Hebron was David's capital when he would become king. And that would be the capital of David for seven and a half years until the rest of Israel united and recognized him as king. And I think there's even a picture there with the Gentiles and the Jews where the people of Hebron recognized David as their king for the first seven and a half years. It's speaking about um, the church and then those who would later come, the rest of Israel, as it were, who recognized him as their king. And he, they, they set him up as king and he made Jerusalem his capital. So uh, I want you to just have a look with me so that you've got the context. In 2 Samuel chapter 5. We're not going to read it all. I just want you to have it so that uh, you have it for your context. You know where to locate it. This, in the first five verses, where it speaks about Hebron being David's uh, capital. That's where he rules from for seven and a half years. Then six through ten uh, is where they, he conquers Jerusalem. So this is still a couple of decades away before Jerusalem is even in Israelite control. Why does David bring the head of the Philistine, the head of Goliath, to Jerusalem? Now, notice Jerusalem is not really that far from the Valley of Elah. We're going to bring that back up for you again. You see the valley, um, uh, the Valley of Rephaim is just, well, it's between there and the Sorek. I'm going to bring you back, excuse me while I scroll through a couple of these. All right, so the Elah Valley, look to the right, or the east. You see the upper Sorek Valley in the upper right-hand corner? Just going past there to the right is where you're going to be coming to Jerusalem and to Bethlehem. That's the direction that David came to begin with. Let's see if we can bring it on, on this map. Do you see Bethlehem and Jerusalem just above it on the right-hand side, top part of the map? Then if you go west and then down just a bit, you'll see the Elah Valley, which is where the battle had been fought. So David would have taken the route coming up right around the area that it says Judah, and then continuing up to the Y of country, hill country, coming into Bethlehem and then northward to Jerusalem. This is where David would be going in order to take the head of, of Goliath there. I think the picture that I see here is this, is Jesus. So David representing Jesus. Why is he taking the head of Goliath to Jerusalem? I mean, he's got to carry that thing. Those many miles, uh, 15 miles or, or thereabouts. It's kind of gruesome, kind of gory. It's very gory. But why, does, why doesn't he just leave it there for the birds of the air and the beasts of the field to come and just devour like he left his body? I believe it's this. This champion represents the, the champion of, of our enemies, the enemy of our souls, all through the ages, representing Satan himself. And even as Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 says, that there's going to be enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. This is God speaking to the serpent, to Satan. There's going to be enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. You will bruise his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And where is it that Jesus crushes the head of the serpent? Jesus is on Mount Moriah, Moriah in Jerusalem, the very place that um, Abraham and Isaac had gone in Genesis 22, 
And I believe that this is what uh, David is doing. He's taking the head of this champion to Jerusalem, although he's, there's, they don't have control of it, but they take it to the hill there, even to the point that just um, beside Jerusalem is the, the, uh, a mound called Nob, or Nob, N-O-B. We're going to see that in just a second. Uh, just outside, so just at Jerusalem, he takes the head of this champion, I believe, prophetically anticipating the champion who's going to come and do that very thing to the enemy of our souls. And he's going to cut off that head. He's going to, he's going to crush the head of our enemy. Then we see that he takes the, the armor of Goliath and puts it in his tent. Hmm. I think there's a picture there more than him just taking it as a souvenir and putting them in his tent. Because in... Um, in 1 Samuel 21, so just going ahead a few chapters, have a look at this. Now David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, Why are you alone and no one is with you? Now Nob is just beside Jerusalem. I mean, they're just, I mean, right on, on side of each other. They own Nob, but they don't own Jerusalem. They don't have control of Jerusalem. After uh, the, temp the tabernacle had been moved, or, or Eli, the high priest, back in chapter 5, uh, up until chapter 5 of 1 Samuel, when the ark had been captured and so on. We'll look at that when we come to Samuel and deal with him. But the ta tabernacle had been removed from there, and and Saul moves it when he becomes king. He moves it to Nob. And now the tabernacle is located just, I mean, Jerusalem is right there. You can see it from Nob. I mean, I mean, it's right there, a hop, skip, and a jump, if you will. Not even that much. And so here's the priest, Ahimelech. David has come to him. He's running away from Saul at this point. David said to Ahimelech, the king has ordered me to, on some business, um, and said to me, don't let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you or what I have commanded you, and I have directed my young men to such and such a place. Now, therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand or whatever can be found. And the priest answered and David and said, there's no common bread on hand, but there is the holy bread, if the young men have at least kept themselves from women. So David answered the priest and said, truly women have been kept from us, about three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated in the vessel this day. So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the show bread, which had been taken from before the Lord, in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. Well, verse 8, David said to Ahimelech, Is there any spear or sword on hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. So the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the aphod. If you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that one here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. So we see in the tabernacle, there's the sword of Goliath. I suspect the rest of the armor is located there as well. But David has no need of the armor, just the sword. It's a picture where David has brought it not just into his own tent, but there's a picture there of him bringing it into the tent of the Lord, the tabernacle, the same word that is being used there, the tabernacle, as the tent of David. Well, we don't have time to get into all of the tent of David that's involved in this, except to see that this is the dwelling place of God Almighty. And he takes from there this weapon. So we see the location of that. We see the victory of this champion is representing Jesus in every respect. The victory wouldn't be his any other way except God had been with him. We see that this is a picture how we can overcome Anything that is in our lives, the enemy coming against us, temptations that would come, uh, that, we would, that would befall us, that we can put our trust and our hope 
in Jesus Christ. That's the picture that is given to us here. And that as Jesus reigns, as he's the champion, he rules and reigns in our hearts, although he's not going to rule as on the throne of David until he returns. He still rules and reigns in the hearts of those who are his today. That he is our rock and he does not sell us. Truly, if there's any selling going on, it's we who sell ourselves to our enemy when we turn away from the Lord. But the Lord says, come back, I'm your rock. I'm still giving you my strength. Turn your eyes to me and I will give you the victory every single time. By faith, their weakness was turned to strength. Would you call on the Lord tonight and say, Lord, please turn my weakness to strength. I'm so frail. I'm so in need of you. Would you be my rear guard, my ASF? Would you be the, the strong head, the strong leader who declares your support, that you support me? Not in my own endeavors, but in those things in which I follow your endeavors, where my eyes are upon the Savior, that you bring deliverance and victory every single time. Lord, I thank you for it. I thank you for the victory you give. Lord, may it be our portion in Jesus' name. God bless you, church. Pray you've been blessed tonight as we've looked at this passage of Scripture, seeing Jesus yet and again. I'm looking forward to being with you on Sunday. <laughs> I'm so excited. As long as the Lord willing and the government um, is responsive and goes through with what they've uh, already indicated, that as of Friday we'll be able to have gatherings up to 50 people. So we will be gathering together here on Sunday morning at our regular time. Looking forward to being with you. God bless you tonight, and we will see you on Sunday.